money. Making a lot of money. Getting cash flow, right? Money. That's why we all invest in Section 8 or want to invest in Section 8, right? It makes money, okay? It's a tough business. It's a great business. I've made millions of dollars investing in Section 8 real estate. Uh, it has uh, really propelled my life, my family's life, my career. So uh, I love Section 8 investing, but that's not to say investing in Section 8 properties is always fun. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's difficult. It is a hard way to make a living, but it is a great way to make a living, right? I don't really think there's many uh, folks out there trying to invest in Section 8 real estate for any reason other than making money at the, at the core of it, right? That's what this is all about. It's about making a bunch of money, folks. And that's why you're going to want to watch this video in its entirety because what I am going to do today is show you 10 ways to make more money with your Section 8 properties. So if you already own Section 8 properties uh, and you've been operating your portfolio, uh, this video should serve as a way for you to increase the profits on your existing portfolio, right? Who wouldn't want to make more money, okay? In addition to that, if you've never purchased Section 8 real estate before, but you're thinking about getting into the Section 8 space, these 10 tips are going to help you understand what you need to do, the best way to operate your properties for the most money. So folks, if you're trying to make a bunch of money with Section 8, let's go! Welcome to the show, y'all. I am James Wise, which if you've never been here before, I would assume, you would have assumed because, you know, it's it's like right there, right? So uh, what we do here on this particular show is we help you guys learn about real estate. We answer your real estate questions. We show you guys information on how to become more profitable landlords. We answer questions you haven't even asked yet, but they're questions I think you need the answers to, right? We discuss hot topics, all that, right? So if you are interested in immersing yourself in the real estate space, y'all. If you want to be an investor like your boy Jay Wise, uh, it'd be cool if you subscribed, right? That'd be good for you. You get information, you get advice, and it'd be cool for me because, like, I get money, and, like, I love money if I haven't established that, right? And I'm assuming most of you, if not all of you that are still watching this particular episode here, love money too, and I'm showing you 10 ways to make more of it with your Section 8 properties. So let's uh, quit pussyfooting around and get into the meat, right? The first thing you can do to your Section 8 portfolio to increase your profits, folks, is install non-locking door handles. Now, I'm not some friggin' psychotic maniac. I'm not an idiot. I don't mean that your doors can't lock. That would be insane. Why would anybody listen to somebody who said that? That makes no sense. No, no, no. Folks, a door. You got your deadbolt, and then you got your door handle, okay? Uh, rookies, people that don't know any better, uh, they get locking handles to go along with their locking deadbolt. The locking handle, folks, it adds no additional security. Obviously, you still need the door to lock, but the deadbolt is all you need, okay? And this is going to help you in many ways, right? Uh, the first of which is at turnovers, right? Because you're going to have to do turnovers as a landlord. I mean, especially with Section 8. Uh, Section 8 tenants, uh, just by their very nature, they're very transient people, okay? Like, a lot of you watching this are, I'm going to guess, homeowners, right? And you probably have a decent chunk uh, of money. You might not be rich or anything of that nature, but I could almost assure you uh, almost every single Section 8 landlord uh, is going to have a higher net worth than almost every single Section 8 tenant, right? That's, that's quite obvious. So what you have to understand is they live a different life than you do, and you might have bought a house and you're living there 10 years, 15 years, things like that. I think they say the average uh, stay, like the, a homeowner, like uh, an owner-occupied person, they typically move on average in the USA every seven years. Section 8 tenants uh, much more frequently than that, okay? So they're transient people. So with that in mind, every time you have to change these locks, because you got to change your locks every time they move out, you want to keep those costs as low as possible, right? So if you do non-locking handles with a deadbolt, instead of every time they move out, 
having to change two locks for every single door. You probably got between two and three doors, right? So let's say you got three doors. You got to change two locks. That's changing six locks. Same house. You don't mess with the handles. You do non-locking handles. You leave them forever. You just swap out the deadbolts. You've cut the amount of things you need to change in half. In addition to that, what it's also going to do is it's going to cut down on your tenant lockouts, right? Tenants lock themselves out of the house all the fucking time, okay? That's annoying because then, you know, depending on how your business model is set up, you're going to need to provide them assistance. Whether they come to you, you go to them. It's a whole thing, right? It's almost impossible. It, it's got, it, it is impossible. I don't, I've never seen someone do it. Uh, it's almost impossible, right, to lock yourself out if the only way to lock the door is with the devil. I mean, I guess, like, you could leave, lock it, because you actually physically have to stick the key in and lock it. And then if you lose your keys while you're out and then you come back, well, yes, you're locked out, right? But that's, like, the only scenario. Whereas with the locking handles, like, you get tenants, they're not even playing on and leaving anywhere. They have their keys inside of their home. They go to leave, go into their yard or something, and, you know, the little little switchy thing there on the door handle is actually set to lock. They shut the door up. Oh, next thing they know, they can't get back in, right? So you get much more frequent lockouts, right? So it's going to reduce your turnover costs, number one. Number two, it's going to reduce your lockouts. So that's why that is a good way to increase your profits, man. Less costs equal more profits. Less problems equal more profits. The next one is low flow toilets. Now, this is a tricky one. I tricked you here. This is a trick. This is a... Uh, like a double negative, low flow toilets by not using them will actually save you money, right? I even myself uh, fell into this trap. I fell into the low flow toilet trap, okay? The people that make these low flow toilets, they got a good marketing department, right? But it's, it's really a trick, okay? Uh, myself, I run a $75 million portfolio. I've had thousands of tenants, so I, I know a thing or two. But just like you, I started with one property. I got things moving one property at a time. So back in the day, I fell for this. I'm like, oh, low-flow toilets this is amazing because uh, if we got to pay the water, we want the tenants to use less water, so let's have them have toilets that use less water. My bill is smaller. I make more money. This is amazing. Unfortunately, in real life, in practice, it doesn't work like that, okay? When uh, freaking Billy Bob Tennant gets fourth meal at Taco Bell, eats himself nine bean burritos, and just freaking wrecks your toilet all night, oftentimes the low-flow toilets... Uh, they do not have enough water. They're not using enough water to effectively, you know, get the fourth meal down, if you know what I'm saying, right? So that leads uh, to more toilet clogs. Toilet clogs become a problem. Problems reduce your profit, right? So if you compare like a toilet, like if you buy a particular property and the toilet was installed in 1975, yes, you want to replace that toilet because I can assure you any toilet on the market today in 2022 is going to use less water and be more low flow than that toilet. But do not fall into the marketing trap of these low flow toilets by going like the extreme route in getting uh, an extremely low flow toilet because oftentimes the savings you're getting in the use of water is, is going to be canceled out by the additional uh, plumbing costs and plumbing issues you have with those low-flow toilets, right? So that one is a trap, a trap I fell into, right? This one ain't a trap, though. Hardwood floors, hard floors of any kind, really vinyl floors, right? We like to utilize hardwoods and vinyl lower flooring. Why? Because earlier I mentioned tenants are transient people, right? Section 8 tenants, they move in, they move out, they move in, they move out, right? You got to deal with turnovers, and you want to reduce your turnovers as much as you possibly can, right? So instead of spending a grand or two, a couple grand, right, every single time someone moves out to replace your carpets, yeah, maybe you get the same carpets out of two or three people. If you go with a hard flooring, you're going to get the same flooring out of, like, 10, 15 times as many tenants, right? If you do your flooring and you do it right, you know, you coat it, you get your hard wood, you coat it with some epoxy. When the freaking cat pisses on the floor, when the kid drops a slushie on the floor, when Mr. Drunky drops a freaking, I don't know, bottle of wine on the floor, right? You don't got staining and things like that. Hard floors, non-carpeted floors are going to do better for you, right? You want to set things up where these properties are hardened and you want uh, things to be able to last and survive, right? Stained carpet, 
Nobody's moving into a house with stained carpet, right? It just it's not how it works. I know some of you are like, oh, they're at Section 8. They won't care. Yes, they will care. They do not want to move into someone else's filth. Is it possible that when they move in, they're going to create their own filth, which is going to later be your problem? Yeah, that fucking happens all the time, but that don't mean they're moving into someone else's filth, folks. Uh, so save yourself some time, money, and effort and just go with a hard surface floor. Will it cost you a little bit more at the time you do it than a carpet? Yes, but over the long haul, over your long-term ownership, it's going to make you more money, right? That's what you want, okay? Here's a good one. Bars on your windows. This is another tricky trick, okay? Uh, here's the deal. Section 8, okay? Section 8 is more popular and more prominent in uh, the ghetto, right? Uh, the poorer the neighborhood, the more frequent you have Section 8, right? Because it makes more sense, right? Because the biggest thing with investing in the ghetto or low-income neighborhoods is the ability to collect rent, right? Uh, as the quality of the neighborhood goes down, uh, the frequency and the reliability, the frequency of which your tenants pay rent, uh, the reliability of your tenants, that goes down, okay? That's just how it works, right? Uh, that is real life, right? And typically, when you have lower incomes in a neighborhood, more Section 8 in a neighborhood, the level of crime typically goes up. Now, I'm sure there's a bunch of liberals out here like, oh my God, that's offensive. How can he categorize neighborhoods like that? Oh my God, that's so wrong. I'm going to leave him a horrible comment about how much of a jerk he is because I knew this one guy, he was on Section 8, and he was really like a really good person, blah, 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 blah. Listen, if you're that person who's watching this video and you're thinking about writing that comment, that's fine, but you can gargle my nutsack because that is just facts, okay? That is just how this works, okay? I am not here to placate you. I am not here to make you feel good about things. I don't live in a world of sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns, okay? I live in the real world. I manage real properties. As I said, I have a $75 million portfolio, and I've dealt with thousands and thousands of tenants. I've been through hundreds and hundreds of evictions. Check out the Tenants from Hell show if... Uh, you don't believe me. I've seen it all, folks. And what I'm here to do, the purpose of this particular show, is to make other Section 8 real estate investors more profitable. And I do that uh, with no regard uh, for your woke-ass emotions. So, like, yeah, that's where we're at. So, we are all living in the real world right now as we're watching this show. And we've all accepted statistics and facts. Lower the income of the neighborhood the higher the crime, okay? That's just where it is. Section 8, more popular, more prevalent, more important, more profitable in the lower-income neighborhoods, right? Because that's like the cheat code, right? When you're in the ghetto, uh, properties are way cheaper, price-to-rent ratios are way better, but that's because the risk has been built in by the sellers uh, and the buyers, right? The risk is there, right? Comps and stuff, they push the values down because the risk of collecting that rent is higher, right? If you're in like an A-grade neighborhood where everybody that's living in your house has got like an 800 credit score, well, you know, you sign a lease for X amount per month, almost every single month they're going to pay that. doesn't work that way in the ghetto, right? So that's where you get your Section 8 uh, because it's government guaranteed rent, right? That's why I've made so much money in Section 8. You remove the biggest risk as a landlord. So with all that said, though, we're in low-income neighborhoods. We're doing Section 8. We're probably dealing with a lot of crime. So a lot of landlords are thinking, boom, I'm going to put some bars on my windows, bro. I don't want to deal with junky motherfuckers coming in and stealing my furnace, stealing my hot water tank, stealing my copper. I'm putting bars on the windows. I'm going to harden my unit. That's great. Your head's in the right place. But unfortunately, this is another one like the low-flow toilets that does not pencil out in the real world. In the real world, what happens is every single time you do this, uh, your lender and or your insurance company will make you remove these bars on the windows because it is, in fact, a fire hazard, folks. You can't put a fucking bar on the window because if the house catches on fire and there's a person or a kid like in a bedroom, they need that egress to be able to escape. So I get where your head's at, landlords. I understand a lot of you. Uh, are thinking, I'm going to put some bars on the windows because I'm sick of people breaking in my house when it's vacant. Unfortunately, in the real world, uh, that's a no bueno, dude. That's not going to work, right? So no bars on your windows, right? I've done many, many deals, have been told by many banks, uh, many insurance providers, uh, where I was brokering the transaction for buyers and sellers, that, hey, 
these windows got to go. It's not going to happen, right? Uh, bank won't fund the loan. Uh, insurance company will not issue the policy. So no bars on the windows, folks. Do not do it, okay? Uh, but what you can do, right, to increase your profits on them Section 8 properties is use the same stuff. Use the same stuff on every one of your properties, okay? Use the same stuff. I'm talking the same paint, the same type of cabinetry, the same handles, the same everything, right? You do not need to take every single house. Let's say you have a 10-house portfolio, right? Or a 10-unit apartment building. You do not need every one of those apartments uh, to look different, to have their own flair. Uh, you do not have to placate your tenants when they call you and they're like, hey, man, it'd be really cool if I could uh, paint Billy's room blue or like paint it like Batman because he loves Batman. No. You need it all to be boring in the same, okay? What you want to do is paint all of your units the exact same color, and that color needs to be a neutral color. What I recommend doing is contacting uh, a paint supplier in your area and asking them what the most popular skew of the last year or two was. And that, folks, that's the color you use on fucking everything, right? If they're like, like for a while, right, uh, agreeable gray, that was, uh, we got that information from Sherwin-Williams. So guess what? Every Holton Wise property, painted agreeable gray on the walls with white trim and, of course, hard floors, right? Because we harden our units. We like to make money, okay? And that's what we did, right? Now I think we're starting to see a little bit of a shift uh, where white is coming back in. Uh, but the moral of the story is you don't pick color based on what you like. You don't pick color based upon what one random tenant likes. You don't pick a color based on what I like or what your wife likes, okay? You pick a color based on what is selling the most to the general population. You do not need to hit a home run for one individual person. You want to hit a double for basically the majority of everyone. And you never want to deviate from that, right? Because then when you m go do a turnover of this property, maybe you only got to paint two uh, particular rooms, but guess what? You already have a backlog of paint and supplies because you use it for everything, right? It's just going to streamline your turnover process. It's going to make things more efficient, quicker, faster, cheaper, which of course is going to increase your Section 8 profits, folks. That's what we're doing, right? Sixth way to increase your Section 8 profits, man, hangy stuff. Hangy stuff ain't your friend. Get rid of hangy stuff. When I say hangy stuff, I'm talking about ceiling fans, right? I'm talking about uh, big pull chains. I'm talking about, like, wall sconce lights things, right? If it can be hung on in break, get that shit out of your properties, okay, folks? Look, I've been in the Section 8 game a long time, and the best advice I can give you about stuff that hangs is... If a motherfucker could break it, they will. That's just how this game works. I don't know why, uh, but more often than not, anything that can be hung on uh, is hung on and eventually broken. So you need to set these properties up in a way that when people turn, you're doing the least amount of work to get it back to a rent-ready standard. Now, again, you get all those Wilkies out there that are like, oh, my God, they, they twist my words. They're like, ah, he's trying to tell landlords they have to do the least amount of work as possible, and he's not fixing his properties. They, like, run away with shit that I say, and, and then they start going in the comments. And for them, again, I say, please refer back to my earlier comment about nut gargling. You should give that a shot because that's not what I said. What I said is you want to do the least amount of work to get to the rent-ready standard. There is still a standard. If this is the standard of quality, safe housing, right, I want investors to have to do as little work as possible to get back up to the standard. I'm not lowering the standard, folks. The standard is here, and if you get a unit that is well-hardened and uh, maybe they only need to go from here to here, it's going to cost them a lot less money than a completely trash unit from here to here. But the standard never changes, folks. We do not provide people with subhabitable housing, but that does not mean we cannot still make intelligent choices of how we set up this housing to increase our profits, folks. All right, so no hangy stuff, right? And then this one, this should go, this should go without saying, right? Tenant screening. Now I've made many videos about tenant screening, and tenant screening, folks, is probably one of the most important things you can do. It is probably the number two, 
the number two factor in how much money you're going to make as a landlord. The number one factor is going to be how you buy, what you buy, and how much you paid for the property, right? The asset itself is going to be the number one determining factor of how much money you make or how much money you lose, right? But right after that, that's number two. That's tenant screening. Tenant screening is incredibly important. So I've made many videos about tenant screening, and I'll link to several of them below. Y'all got to check tenant screening out. But here's the thing. I think most people are of the opinion that, yeah, dude, I know tenant screening is important. But what I see is I see people putting on blinders. Uh, they start to think like, oh, but I'm doing Section 8, so I don't need to screen my tenants because James already told me, bruh, Section 8 is the cheat code in the ghetto. When you do Section 8, the government's paying the tenants' rent, so I don't care. doesn't matter. I'm getting rent any which way, so why do I need to screen them? I get where you're coming from. Makes sense. But no, you still got to screen these people, folks. First of all, Section 8 doesn't pay 100% of the rent in most situations. So you still need to collect some rent from the tenant. You need to make sure they're not an asshole and they're actually going to pay you that portion of the rent, number one. Number two, let's say you got a multi-unit building, right? You could have one Section 8 tenant who's just a freaking maniac. And even though he or she pays their rent to you, partly from the government, partly from their self, they might be such an asshole that they cause some of your other tenants in the building to move out. So in reality, that person isn't actually making you money. They're actually losing you money, right? Things of that nature, right? So you still have to screen these people, okay? Uh, yes, collecting all of their rent is like 90% of the game, but you need to damn sure make sure you don't put somebody in there that is so horrible that they're going to cause other people who would have normally paid you rent to not do so, right? So if you want to make money, you got to get everybody's rent. So don't put a bad apple in one of your properties. Don't think just because the government's kicking in some money, you can skip the tenant screening process. It is always, always, always important, right? Think about people, uh, violent felons, right? You don't, you, you don't want people in there who are dangerous, all kinds of stuff, right? Just whatever you do, folks, never, ever let your guard down when it comes to tenant screening, right? If you already own the house, because I said it's the second most important thing when you're getting started in real estate. But guess what? Since the first thing is how you buy, where you buy, how much you pay, if you already own the particular Section 8 property, you already own it. So now tenant screening is the most important thing, right? Because the other thing don't matter because you already made the decision to take the property. So now you own the property. So now there is nothing more important than tenant screening. So never, ever, ever, ever skip out on tenant screening. Make sure you check out my other tenant screening stuff because I give it to you straight. Which leads me to my eighth point of how to make more money with Section 8. You gotta evict motherfuckers! At Holton Wise, we help people achieve financial freedom through passive real estate investments. We provide a complete set of turnkey real estate services, including property acquisition, property management, home renovation, and much more. But most importantly, at Holton Wise, it's all about our people first culture. We put people over profits. Simply put, at Holton Wise, we care. I like working at Holton Wise because it's really for the people and the culture. When I'm here, I feel like I can work as myself. I run Holton Wise like an open book. If anybody has any questions about what we do or how we do it, we got nothing to hide here at Holton Wise. We do what we say we're gonna do, and then we do it. This place is really for the community. We buy houses, sell houses, we rent houses, we do it all. My leadership style at Holton Wise, it's all about leading by example. I wanna show people that even in a stressful business like real estate investment, we always need to keep our cool and act professional. I love working with James and in my position, I get to work with James one-on-one -on -one every single day. James is a people pleaser, he's a people person, he's a real philanthropist. They don't tear you down at Holton Wise. It's all about building people up. What the f are you two lazy pieces of doing in here, huh? Always, always, always just sitting on your f never doing any work. Do you want me to place you girls with robots? Is that what you like?
Even in my position, it can be very stressful dealing with tenants. That's why James always makes sure that my head is in a great place. When making mistakes at Holton Wise, they don't get angry, they don't get mad, they don't yell at you. They just give you a gentle nudge in the right direction. It's the professionalism. You know, nothing too crazy happens at the office. Everything's pretty low key. From the moment I started working with Holton Wise, it was clear to me that I wasn't just another customer. I was like family. I think good leaders ask, how can we increase the bottom line? How can we increase profitability? But here, I want to be a great leader. And what great leaders ask is how can I serve my employees, my customers, my people, the community? It's all right. It's just the game. You're a Section 8 landlord now. Evicting motherfuckers is part of your life, okay? Would it be great if we could all get into this business, we could all be landlords and we'd never have to evict a motherfucker? Sure, that'd be great, okay? But it'd also be great if a rainbow with a pot of gold came out of my butt when I farted. But that's not reality, okay? In reality, you're gonna have to evict some motherfuckers. So... My uh, biggest takeaway, if you, your biggest takeaway from this advice here, is do not be afraid of evictions, right? And I get it. Evicting people can be scary. I've even done a story, done a video on my very first eviction, which, guess what? I put that in the notes below for you to check out too, right? Yes, at this point in my life, I've evicted hundreds and hundreds of people, and it's like second nature. I understand the process. We've highlighted the eviction process. We've shown you guys uh, many, many videos of live evictions. So if you want to learn about evictions and the aftermath and the costs and the process and just see the whole thing, we got that all for you here on Holton Wise TV. Uh, but the moral of the story is even before we did all this, even before the $75 million portfolio, we were brand new and we were a little afraid of how the eviction process could work, right? It's a scary process. It's, it's not fun. Everybody's on edge. There's armed men with uh, badges and guns running around, kicking in doors, violence. People have been killed during evictions many times. We've covered those kinds of stories here on the channel as well. Uh, so, you know, it's a scary thing. I get it. Uh, but what you cannot do as a new landlord, as a new Section 8 investor, is be afraid of it. When it comes time to pull that Band-Aid off, you got to be ready, willing, and able to evict a motherfucker. Because I see this time and time and time again, right? Tenants, they start acting up. Whatever it is that they're doing that gets into the situation where the right move is for that landlord to evict them. Uh, novice landlords, new landlords, things of that nature. They let that tenant string them along, string them along. They try to uh, convince themselves that it will be easier, cheaper, quicker, less painless to try to work something out with that tenant who's just grifting them the whole time. And you end up having to evict that person down the road at a cost that is much more substantial to you than if you just uh, nutted up and made the move to evict them in the first place, right? So as a Section 8 investor, folks, you just, if you want to do this business, you cannot fear eviction. You have to understand that that is a tool at your disposal that must be utilized. If you're uncomfortable with that, if you feel bad about that, if you got, you know, a little teeny violin playing in your soul here uh, and you think evicting people is not something you're into, hey, that's great. That's cool. No judgment. You seem like a great person, but I'll tell you this. This ain't your bag, bro. If you're allergic to shellfish, don't go to Red Lobster on your birthday, okay? If you don't want to do evictions, real estate ain't for you. Section 8 ain't for you. If you want to get into this game, you need to friend up with the thought of evicting some motherfuckers, all right? That's a great one, right? Number nine. Uh, meet with your local housing authority, all right? Meet your local housing authority, right? Section 8 is everywhere, right? Every market, every city, this or that, right? There's Section 8 everywhere, right? Uh, but Section 8 is ran by housing authorities, like where I'm at. I'm in the Cleveland market, okay? So we have what's called CMHA. That is our local housing authority. They are the people that operate this thing, right? Uh, so wherever you live, you're not going to have CMHA. You're going to have something different, right? And oftentimes, it's very, very difficult to deal with the government programs, uh, 
Oftentimes, if you speak to five of their employees and you ask them the same question, you're going to get five completely different answers, okay? There's a lot of red tape when it comes to dealing with the government, okay? So I'm not here to tell you it's always going to be easy. It's not. It's difficult, and that's why this becomes even more important. They do provide resources in how you can be a better housing provider partner with them, right? So is the game ever going to be simple, smooth, and easy? No, it's always going to be kind of difficult. You can't change the rules of the game, folks, but what you can do is understand them and learn how to play it as best you possibly can. And they oftentimes will provide you guys with resources, how to better streamline your business with what their uh, business is, right? They even... I've seen like seminars and I've sent many members of our team and I've been to them myself personally, seminars where they talk uh, to owners and landlords about this or that. So hook up with your local housing authority, folks. Do not be afraid to contact them. And if you got to go up the chain as far as like, uh, employees like start getting into the managers and the department heads that's fine right because you know the frontline employees just like any business you know they're going to be the least educated and least knowledgeable and least skilled employees you're going to talk to right like nobody's ever accused mcdonald's of having super smart cashiers okay but i'm sure when you get to the executive level they know what's going on right so same thing with your housing authorities right uh do not be afraid to reach out uh, again and again and again and really try to engulf yourself in their training materials, uh, seminars, this or that. There's typically almost always some type of resources. So you need to really just get all of that. Get it all up in there, man. Get it in there like it's a Big Mac and uh, you'll be able to have a more smooth process. I'll, I'm not going to lie to you. It's never going to be like the most smooth thing in the world. But uh, the smoother you can get it, the better and the more money you're going to make. And then lastly... The grand finale. You got to vote red, bro. <laughs> now, this isn't like, uh, like, oh, my God, get out there and vote for this guy or vote for that guy kind of deal. I don't really give a shit who you vote for, to be honest with you. Uh, but look. Here's, here's here's the name of the game. I know a lot of people think politics and real estate don't have anything to do with each other. And guess what? Those people are fucking stupid because they do, okay? If you don't believe me, please check out all of the content that I have produced about landlord-tenant laws in places like California. The fact of the matter is the more blue uh, your locality is, uh, the less fair your landlord-tenant laws are going to be. And then some people will also say the more red uh, your locale is, the less fair your landlord-tenant laws are going to be, right? Um, what's fair and what's not fair is a, a matter of opinion. Uh, but what is a matter of a fact is uh, blue areas tend to run with tenants having a higher amount of rights and protections than uh, red areas do, right? So your red areas are going to lean towards the landlord and your blue areas are going to lean towards the tenants. So again, I actually don't give a shit who you vote for and I actually don't give a shit who or where you live, right? You live wherever you want. You want to live in California because the sun is shining and it's beautiful out there and you got Hollywood and you got the ocean and you got all kinds of good stuff. That's great. But you should read up on the policies because being a landlord in a ultra liberal place, ultra blue place like California can be a nightmare uh, with the laws and they're getting worse. Right. So what you should do, folks, is if you're considering investing in Section 8 real estate and you do live in a blue location, I would suggest you invest out of state in a red location myself we're in ohio all of our section 8 properties are in ohio which is a red state so uh are we the most landlord friendly market in in the world no right you get down to arkansas your tenants don't pay rent i'm like pretty sure you're allowed to shoot them like i think that's like a law down there them motherfuckers don't give a shit uh we're not like that but i think it's relatively fair with a little bit of a landlord lean and that's what we do folks we help People who live in those ultra blue areas where the laws don't make sense, we help them invest in Section 8 rental properties. So if that's you and you've enjoyed this video thus far and you want to learn more about working with us, why don't you go ahead and click the notes below to book a free call with my team, show you how you can become an out-of-state passive Section 8 investor. And uh, additionally, 
please, I encourage you to check out some of the content I hinted at before if you're thinking about getting into the Section 8 business, right? You need to see what we got going on on the Tennis from Hell show so you can see how bad things can really get. And uh, politically, you need to understand the lay of the land if you're in a really blue place because some of the laws uh, that they're putting out there in places like California are, are very uh, unbelievable if you're a landlord, right? How about laws that uh, prevent you from selling your property uh, without an additional tax or an additional fee? How about laws that prevent you from evicting a tenant who's stealing from you uh, for years at a time? How about laws that prevent, uh, well, actually, there's there's laws that prevent house flippers. There's there's laws that uh, prohibit you from evicting tenants. And then there's even laws where if you do actually get to evict a tenant, you have to pay their rent at the next landlord's house, right? You might be thinking I'm completely insane. I'm just making stuff up, trying to scare people, trying to drum up more business. Uh, number one, yes, I'm trying to drum up more business. But number two, all of those are real and we've covered them. So check that out as well. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.